She runs an industry-leading research team of economists and analysts recognized by a wide audience of media, policymakers, and professionals. In this episode, Dr. Svenja Goodell shares her journey to becoming the chief economist at Zillow, one of the leading online real estate marketplace companies. Find out how COVID-19 has impacted the real estate market and housing predictions. Everything from home value gains and credit to challenges the market is facing and tips for investing in a home. Meet the leaders shaping the new era of credit. This is the Vantage Core Podcast. Today, we talk to Dr. Svenja Goodell, Chief Economist at Zillow. This is part one. So I went to the University of Rochester for my undergrad degree in upstate New York. Lots of snow. <laughs> and got an undergrad degree there in, in economics. After college, I worked at the New York Fed for two years. And then at night, I actually got a master's in economics. Funny story there. I actually, I went to NYU to get my master's in economics and it was a great program. I really enjoyed it. But I initially joined to be able to use their pool because I really like swimming. And I lived right by NYU. So it was a good location to go swimming. And I ended up really liking the program, the master's program. So I ended up not having too much time left over at the end of the day to go swimming, which was kind of ironic, but did that for a while. And then after that, moved up to Boston to join analysis group to work as an analyst there for a year and met some really great people and was introduced to the concept of doing a PhD in finance, which I didn't really even know was a thing before that. You know, I was well aware of PhDs in, in economics, but not finance. So really like that. So decided to apply to the University of Rochester's finance program, the Simon School, and was accepted. So moved back up to Rochester after my year in Boston to complete my PhD. That took five years. And then from there, moved out to Seattle to join Zillow. And that's nine and a half years ago now. So <laughs> been, been at Zillow for quite some time as their chief economist. I came on as a senior economist at the time, and uh, it was, you know, there wasn't really an econ function at uh, a well-developed econ function at Zillow at the time. We had our chief economist, my boss, who's now the chief analytics officer, Stan Humphreys, and it was really only him in the econ function at the time. So they were looking for an economist and I was like, hey, that sounds good. I can, I can, I can do some housing economics. And, you know, it was a fairly small startup still at the time and hadn't gone public yet. And so didn't quite know what I was getting myself into, but clearly I have enjoyed it since. It's been a fun ride. COVID has really sent us all in a tailspin. You know, it's been a year. And I think, interestingly enough, housing has been the bright spot in a lot of what we've seen in the economy and how we've been able to move through this. Yeah, at a very high level view, COVID has been a magnifying glass for a lot of trends that we saw prior to the pandemic. And it's just sped these trends up and things like, it's always been true that as families form and they get older and have kids, that they move to the suburbs. And we see slightly more of that and some speeding up of that now because people want space and they want to be able to you know, have an office to work from home and, and all these things. So some of these trends were already previously there. Unfortunately, we've also seen the pandemic affect people very unequally. I think women have been hit harder by the pandemic and have become are higher on the unemployment side. We've seen you know, people of color being harder hit, oftentimes because they work in industries that have been hit harder by the pandemic, such as the arts or the service industry, transportation, where you just have different representation by all these groups and unemployment is much higher in these sectors. And some of it will be long-term unemployment that isn't going to bounce back very quickly, especially as the pandemic has been marching on for so long. But having said that, in terms of home value appreciation, so how many homes are costing, we're seeing very steady upticks there. We're currently right around 5% annual appreciation for homes. So very strong. Rents have slowed down quite a bit, but sales have bounced back in terms of actual activity. So despite the pandemic and beside the housing market you know, going into a complete stop in the beginning of the pandemic back in March and April, sales are only down 3% year to date compared to last year. So it's a very sharp V recovery for sales and prices never really took a breather. It was always very strong appreciation. So both of those factors are doing very, very well and uh, helped in quotes by the fact that there's very little inventory. So if you're out there trying to find a home, particularly starter home, it's extremely tough trying to find something right now. Inventory is down something like 35% from a year ago. So very low inventory. And 
again, this is not news. I feel like we've talked about low inventory for the last three or so years at this point, but COVID has just exacerbated that because most sellers aren't super interested in selling right now. And there are still a bunch of buyers that would like love to buy a house. So time on market has shrunken. It's, you know, homes are, they're going like hotcakes out there, <laughs> you know? When we went into the Great Recession, we had an oversupply of housing. You know, there was overbuilding, overconstruction, new construction was very high. You get all these cookie cutter subdivisions that went up everywhere. And that's at least part of the reason we got into trouble with the Great Recession. And then builders were hurt in the Great Recession quite a bit. We saw a bunch of consolidation in the industry and you know, walked away from that recession really with the lesson of, okay, let's slow this down. We're not going to build a whole lot. So for the last 10 years, we have been underbuilding and population growth isn't stopping in a sense that we keep increasing the population. It's, it's steadily growing. And so more and more people need homes, but we're not building enough homes. And so the average age of an existing home gets sold over and over again, it keeps getting older and older. So the housing stock is just aging quite a bit and we're not adding a lot of new homes to the mix. And it's been tough for builders out there as well because it keeps getting to be more expensive to buy homes, you know, finding available lands, lumber prices are extremely high right now. Labor, there has been a labor shortage. Some of that has been fixed by now, but coming out of the Great Recession, there was a labor shortage because a lot of people were out of a job. No one was building. And so a lot of those people that used to be in that industry moved into different industries and had to you know, retrain to do something else. And so there was a real labor shortage for a while. Financing was a big problem, trying to get money to actually build homes. And so all of that meant that builders weren't building. And it was a combination of all these factors that kind of got us there. And here we are today, and builders are building a lot more. That's the silver lining or the, the truly bright spot, even within the housing industry right now, that builder sentiment is very high. And we're seeing strong annual new home sales, you know, right around a million annualized. And so that's been going well. That's trending up, but it's still lagging in, in terms of where it had been or probably how much we actually need to feed the demand from buyers right now. There are a ton of really strong tailwinds right now in the housing market. So some things are sustainable, other things aren't. So if you look at the overall cost of houses right now and how fast home values are growing, I don't think that's really sustainable because at some point you're going to hit a limit. And we've seen this happen already in really expensive markets where you have homes that are just really expensive and then you have affordability issues. You know, incomes do not grow as fast as home values do. So you have a real mismatch. So you have to spend a larger and larger share of your monthly income on that mortgage payment. And even for rents, this holds true for rents as well. And at some point, people just say, I, I can't afford this anymore. I'm not going to be able to buy a house. There's only so much home values can climb up without people starting to walk away. And you know, right now, we're still in, in this really interesting situation that there are enough buyers out there that have enough money to actually afford these prices. And you know, again, COVID has not been an equal opportunity offender in terms of impacting economically, right? You have a lot of industries that are able to convert to work from home. Like you and I are working from home right now and we're still getting paid and a lot of people aren't that lucky. And so some people are much harder hit than other people. And so it's really fairly unequally distributed. And so far we still have enough demand on the housing side to keep those prices high. And we have a lot of tailwinds on the demographic side that will continue to push some of this where you have a lot of millennials just aging into housing in terms of buying their first home. And then Generation Z, which is also a very, very large, um, if not larger generation, is on its heels to take over after that. And they're just aging into the rental market fully. And so you have all these demographic tailwinds. But again, if incomes don't keep up, we're going to see a mismatch there and affordability will become a real issue over time. We only have so far limited evidence that we're actually seeing very strong migration into the suburbs and rural areas away from cities. We all read about it. You know, every day I pick up the paper and I can see an article about how someone moved from New York City into the Hamptons or up to Westchester or something. But it's not as widespread as you might think from media coverage. And I think we're starting to see the first inklings where urban home value appreciation is starting to slow down a little bit. And you have suburban home value appreciation being stronger. But there are a lot of examples where urban home values are growing 
just as much as suburban home values are growing. And demand is quite the same in terms of time on markets and how many people are viewing homes in, in the two different you know, urban versus suburban regions. So it's not a blanket statement quite yet. There are cities like San Francisco and New York where we are starting to see people moving out of the downtown areas. Again, also driven by the fact that it's just darn expensive to live in San Francisco and New York. So you know, if you don't have to commute to work every day, you probably will pick up and choose to live somewhere else. And we can particularly see that on the rental side. So this urban flight is very real for folks that rent, but only limited evidence for people that own. But you know, time will tell. I do think that these trends take a fairly long time to unfold just because it takes a long time to buy a house as well. And so these things will just, we'll kind of see where they go, especially as employers are moving to different models of more hybrid or work from home setups and giving their employees more flexibility, then people also choose to relocate into different areas. But, you know, we're just in the beginning of these trends and uh, over time we'll see where it kind of takes us. Rents are still appreciating uh, nationally, at least more so in other parts of the country than, than others, but just below percent annual appreciation right now nationally. And that's been quite the slowdown because prior to the pandemic, the rents and home values were really moving in fairly same trends. You know, they were appreciating at the same rate and showed the same movements, but they really diverged quite a bit during the pandemic. And I think because we've seen so much behavior like doubling up again, where people move in with roommates or you move back with your parents, a lot of that is driven by unemployment so for younger adults as they have had to move back home because they can't afford to actually live in their rental anymore. We're seeing more concessions on the landlord side. So some of these things will leave their mark and we're seeing this in, uh, in rental prices. Now, I don't know about hitting rock bottom because I do think there's strong, again, these, these demographic pushes that we're seeing on the for sale side also affect the rental side. So millennials are renting longer than ever. The first time buyer age is, is right around 34. And that's way higher than what it used to be 20 years ago. So people are, are staying in their rental for much longer. That increases rental demand. If people are skittish about the housing market they or the for sale market they rent, we have a very large Generation Z ready to rent. So there's a lot of demand for rentals. It's just not as much. We saw a lot of building on the rental side. It came back quite a bit from like the lows of 2009, 10. And so we've made up on the supply side. but there's still some wiggle room there. And I think we'll, we'll start to see a lot more strength in the long run in the rental market again. No, I don't think the home value gains that we've been seeing are sustainable. Right now we're at 5% and we'll probably keep seeing some strong gains for the next you know six to eight months. But at some point we're going to start seeing some slowdowns. And right now it's being pushed up quite a bit by the fact that there's very low inventory and quite a bit of demand. As we see more inventory hit the market, which surely we will as the pandemic is as soon as there's a vaccine or people, you know, some other fix to be able to let us move more normally, if you will, we're going to see more people willing to sell their homes. And we've talked a bunch about, you know, is there going to be a flood of new inventory? I don't think there'll be a flood. I think we'll see more inventory come on. It wouldn't be crazy to think that we'd reach back to inventory levels that we saw pre-pandemic. And that's going to increase supply overall, and that will relax some of that price appreciation. Also, we're going to start hitting uh, affordability constraints where people aren't able to afford homes anymore. And even though we have very strong demographic tailwinds, if you aren't able to buy a home because you can't save for a down payment, and if you aren't able to qualify for a mortgage, these things will keep you back, and that's going to hinder the demand side as well. So in the long run, we will start to move back to more sustainable rates of home value appreciation. But for right now, they're, they're here to stay in the short term, at least. This podcast is brought to you by Vantage Core Solutions, a higher level of confidence. Thanks for listening.